Hey guys, and welcome to Dylan Bean and Psychic Celluloid Signal's first collaboration. In this review, Dylan and I will be taking a look at David Cronenberg's classic film Videodrome. If you aren't familiar with Dylan's channel yet, go check it out. He posts fantastic film reviews, unboxing videos, and an array of other fantastic film-themed YouTube videos. Additionally, we're going to be making a review for another Cronenberg film, Rabid, and that'll be posted on his channel soon, so stay tuned. I'm going to be doing a full synopsis of this film, so just skip ahead to the time down in the corner if you haven't seen Videodrome yet. Videodrome is a 1983 body horror film starring James Woods as the film's anti-hero, Max Wren. Wren is the president of Civic TV, a station specializing in content of violent and sexual nature. Yikes! This film begins with Wren seeking out new material for his station and finding that he's unable to come across anything tough enough for his audience and his own tastes. Amongst Wren's employees is Harlan, who he hired to intercept television signals. Harlan appears to be Max's biggest asset when he gets a hold of a sadomasochistic program called Videodrome. Meanwhile, Max appears on a talk show alongside radio host Nikki Brand, played by Blondie vocalist Debbie Harry, as well as the strange philosopher Brian Oblivion, who refuses to be personally present for interviews and gives strikingly bizarre answers to questions. We don't get to see how the interview went, but it appears that it basically served as a means for Max to hook up with Nikki. Which leads us to Nikki's kinky side. Yes, who would have thought Debbie Harry would play a masochistic nymphomaniac? Well, after a handful of pretty <coughs> unique sexual sequences, we find out Nikki wa wants to be in Videodrome. Who would have guessed? To make the news even more sketchy, Max learns that not only is Videodrome fueled by political agendas, it's actually real snuff. It's also connected to Brian Oblivion, that, if that guy wasn't creepy enough already. Max meets up with Oblivion's daughter, Bianca, who basically tells him that her father won't meet people in the flesh, so she sends him back home, where, holy shit, what's happening to that VHS tape? Shortly after meeting with Bianca, Max gets a videotape from Brian, and in a bizarre hallucinogenic sequence, learns that Oblivion himself helped make the Videodrome signal, that it causes brain tumors, and that Oblivion's cohorts use it against him. Talk about psychedelic television. <laughs> Max asks Harlan if he's been hallucinating, and he says no. Huge red flag there. But Max continues to see things. Most notably, a very yonic orifice appears on Max's abdomen which we'll get back to. Max, at his wit's ends, comes into contact with Barry Convex, a creator of Videodrome and, ironically, an eyeglasses manufacturer. Barry records his hallucinations, because that's apparently possible. Then Max wakes up at home, in bed, next to a dead body. Harlan comes over and confirms that the body is actually not there. Max has basically lost his marbles at this point. But that's not all. Harlan is working for Barry, which is why he wasn't hallucinating for those keeping score. And this is where the orifice comes into play. It's not a vagina, you perverts. It's a fleshy VHS player. Okay, maybe it's both. Either way, they use it to program Max to kill his partners at Civic TV, which he does with his grotesque gun hand hybrid, which reminded me of the body horror in the movie Tetsuyo the Iron Man. He's also programmed to kill Bianca, but she's smarter than your average VHS hoarder. She anticipates the attack and reprograms Max, because Max is basically just a human weapon at this point, and he guns down Harlan and Barry, who wanted to use Videodrome to kill everyone who consumes violent media. Finally, Nikki returns in a hallucinated television image, telling Max that to defeat Videodrome and become the new Flesh, he must first kill the old Flesh, whatever that means. Long live the new Flesh? All right, guys, now I'm going to pass it over to Dylan, and he's going to talk about the film's background and deeper meanings. Thanks, Josh. That was a hell of a summary. If you're not already subscribed to Psychic Cellulite Signals, I really recommend subscribing. They're great guys and their content is amazing. Anyway, before I get into my segment, I just want to say that all the information that I'm giving to you here was taken from the Arrow Video Release Blu-ray of Videodrome. There's so many great special features on that disc. 
including documentaries and a roundtable discussion with John Carpenter, John Landis and David Cronenberg, the director of Videodrome. I think before we discuss Videodrome, it's important to understand where David Cronenberg was coming from as a director and a person. He believed that life began and ended with the body. He didn't believe in a spiritual afterlife, so he found what happened inside of our bodies very scary. More specifically, the internal changes that we could not control, for better or worse. This is very apparent when you watch Videodrome, as our character Max, played by James Wood, goes through a lot of external and internal changes as he continues to watch the Videodrome signal. I also found David Cronenberg's views on censorship really interesting. He discussed how he felt movies shouldn't be censored. He didn't think adults should censor other adults, but that there should be a classification system in place so that children didn't see movies they weren't ready to see. But he did feel that if you were an adult, it was your responsibility to walk out of the theatre. He felt if the responsibility lied with the director and the distributor, then it also lied with the viewer. And I completely agree with that. And I don't think that art should be censored. I think this may have influenced how he approached creating Videodrome and the subject matter that he put into a lot of his films. Something you may have noticed when watching David Cronenberg's films is that he likes to write very morally ambiguous characters. He felt that a moral character was usually only in a film to push the story forward. He preferred flawed characters who lived in the shade of grey. And that's very apparent in Videodrome as Max is a very sleazy character and you may not necessarily like him but you will understand him. This was something that attracted James Woods to the role as he preferred a character who was more flawed and not necessarily a nice guy. But he also felt that Videodrome as a movie was like a slow descent into a nightmare and that really attracted him to the role. He said that David Cronenberg would only write his scripts at night as he wrote his nightmares. Although David Cronenberg himself did say he was writing the script on set as he hadn't finished the movie yet. This was pretty incredible as it meant that David Cronenberg was able to sell an incomplete script, although the funding for the movie meant that they had to complete the shoot in that calendar year, putting a lot of stress on production. One thing I found interesting though was that the first thing shot for Videodrome was the softcore pornography that features inside the movie. It's called Samurai Dreams and it entails an Asian woman who wakes up, pleasures herself and is confronted by two samurais. They then proceed to have a three-way. So Videodrome all began with a softcore pornography which is pretty incredible. <laughs> While we're talking about softcore pornography, did you know that Max's TV station was based off of a real TV station in the 1970s called City TV? This station didn't have much of a viewership until the director of the station decided to start showing softcore pornography. His viewership then greatly increased. I think this perfectly mirrors what's happening in Videodrome, as Max's TV station is only being watched because it's sexy and it's violent. He needs to push the envelope if he doesn't want to lose his viewership. That's why when he sees Videodrome, he doesn't see somebody being injured or being tortured. He sees something violent and something that is low to produce. He is fascinated by it and he cannot stop watching. In fact, when he is told that it's really a snuff film, he just can't believe it. He's become so desensitised to what he's seeing on television that he can't recognise fiction from reality. And I think that is a beautiful social commentary. And this is where Videodrome really succeeds. Another area where Videodrome really succeeds is the practical effects, which were overseen by the great Rick Baker. He had previously worked on An American Werewolf in London by John Landis and had overseen the werewolf transformation scene, which I'll get Josh to insert that clip here. <laughs> Did he put it in? I'm going to assume he did. And if he did, that's pretty awesome, right? He was a great artist and he really, really influenced how brilliant Videodrome is. If it wasn't for him, I don't think the movie would have been half as successful. Yes, it would have been brilliant and had a great story, but really what stands out to me is the practical effects. They're absolutely a sight to behold. And he was attracted to this project because it wasn't creating something that existed, it was creating something new. He got to use his imagination and help David Cronenberg bring his vision to life. Working alongside Rick Baker to create these practical effects was a great team with an average age of 23 years old, which is truly incredible to be that young and working on a movie that iconic. I'm actually so jealous. Earlier in the video, you heard Josh talking about the VHS tapes. 
These were in fact Betamax tapes and would not be commonly used by a TV station as they had a lower resolution than VHS tapes. But Betamax tapes were smaller than VHS tapes, making them perfect to fit into a stomach slit. You may also remember that earlier in the video I was talking about the pressure of the production and having to finish the movie in that calendar year. This meant that the final day to shoot was the 24th of December, Christmas Eve, and on this day they had to blow up a television which was filled with sheep guts. The first attempt failed and they had to do it later on in the day, which meant that when they went home to their families they were all smelling of sheep guts and couldn't stomach to look at their food. Long live the new flesh. <laughs> When making this video, I had hoped to go more in depth into the meanings of Videodrome, but it turns out that David Cronenberg summed it up pretty well himself, so I'm just going to read a quote from him here. I'm also paraphrasing a little bit. Videodrome is not a criticism of TV or networks. It's exploring to see what happens when people go to extremes when trying to alter their environment to the point where it alters their physical selves. I'd actually thought it was a criticism on television, but David Cronenberg also summed up why I may have taught that in this next quote, which I will also be paraphrasing slightly. He felt that Videodrome was entertainment in the fullest sense. I like people to entertain my films rather than my films to entertain them, entertain the ideas in the film. What I think this means is that basically we bring our own thoughts forward to the table when we're watching a movie like Videodrome. We interpret it in our own ways. So there isn't just one meaning behind the movie, there's many meanings and my understanding of the film may be different to yours. So I'm just going to finish up my segment there by saying it was an absolute joy to work with Josh on this project. I love Videodrome. I only saw it this year and I fell in love with the movie and I couldn't stop watching the special features. It was just engrossing to watch all of this content about Videodrome and to dissect it. So thank you, Josh. It was an absolute pleasure to work with you. Take it away. Wow. I don't know how to follow that up. This is one of my favorite films, and I can't recommend it enough. I completely understand Cronenberg's fear of the body and bodily changes, and it's a huge fear that I share. I think we all do to a degree, and WebMD would certainly agree with that. I think this film is one of the best examples of, in cinema history of this fear, but this film does so much more. As Dylan mentioned, this film has many meanings and explores so many topics we could do an entire series on Videodrome alone. But for now, I'm just going to say that it's been a blast doing my first collaboration with Dylan. I hope you guys had as much fun with this review as we did. Take care, guys. And remember, television is reality, and reality is less than television.